Mark chapter 14 is where we're at this morning. We've been making our way verse by verse through the gospel of Mark. And we're now in the 43rd verse of the gospel of Mark chapter 14. Jesus has already partaken of the Last Supper, which would have been his last meal. He has his disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane at this point. They have been um, praying. And Jesus asking three of the disciples, the, the, what we would call the inner circle or, or the upper echelon of ministry that he had. It was Peter, James, and John were with him. And the other guys, the eight, were left at the, at the gate of the Garden of Gethsemane. They went into the Garden of Gethsemane and they were praying. And Jesus said, asked them to pray with him. And every time he would go away, he would come back, they would find them sleeping. But Jesus was intent in his prayer. And it, 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 the intensity was so, um, so thick that, that we're told that he literally was sweating blood. It was blood were coming through his pores. Luke tells us, the doctor tells us that, that, that that's what Jesus was experiencing, knowing what was about to transpire. And so that's where we find ourselves. They're still in the garden. Um, what we're going to pick up in verse 43 as this um, big group of soldiers and along with, with some scribes and Pharisees had come to have Jesus arrested. And that's where we pick up verse 43. Immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, with a great multitude, with swords and clubs, came from the chief priest and the scribes and the elders. Now his betrayer had given them a signal saying, whomever I kiss, he's the one, seize him and lead him away safely. And as soon as he had come, immediately he went up to him. He said to him, Rabbi, Rabbi, and he kissed him. And they laid their hands on him and took him. And one of those who stood by drew his sword, struck the servants of the high priest, cut off his ear. And Jesus answered and said to them, have you come out as against a robber with swords and with clubs to take me? I was daily with you in the temple teaching and you did not seize me, but the scripture must be fulfilled. And they took him and they fled. Jesus here is now being met by the religious leaders who really were the instigators of all of this, the scribes, the Pharisees, the, they, they would have been given um, some Roman guards or Roman soldiers to, to kind of um, you know, help keep order in Jerusalem during this particular time of, of, the, of the feast. It's Passover. There's, there's upward from two million people that had gathered to... Um, celebrate the Passover. And so they were, they were prepared for you know, any kind of riots or any kind of uprisings that were taking place. John tells us in chapter 18 of this same particular um, passage or the parallel passage to this in verse three, that Judas having received a detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees with lanterns, torches, and weapons had come. Now, a detachment was a, a Roman group of 600. And so, it, you, you know, you, you, you kind of have this idea that, you know, they had this small contingency, maybe 12, 15 guys came to arrest Jesus. No, it was a detachment of 600 soldiers plus Pharisees, scribes, elders that had come to get Jesus. So you, you, you can only imagine you would, you would hear the, the, their armor clinking as they're walking along the road coming up the hill and they had torches it was dark out already it would have lit up you know the side of the mountain with, with the fire of the torches and they would have you know been very um it would have been a it would have been a scene and there's Jesus with the 12 actually 11 disciples 12 counting Jesus at this point we may have been a few others kind of around we know Mark Mark was there we'll see that in a minute who wrote the account. And what's, what's incredible is you, as you look at this whole thing, Judas had given the signal. I'm going to go up 
and I'm going to kiss Jesus, and he's the one who you want to arrest. He's the guy that you're looking for. Now, that tells us a couple things. That Jesus blended in with the, with the other disciples. They, they didn't go, you know, look for the guy that's glowing. <laughs> he has a halo on his head. You know, you can't miss him. <laughs> Especially in the dark when he's, woo, woo, you know, you just, no. Judas had to go identify him. Judas walks up and, and he gives him a kiss. But something happened prior to that. And we find it again in John's account, John chapter 18. You see, Mark is giving us the condensed version. Mark, Mark, Mark is kind of giving us the account in a, in a very um, rapid uh, succession as, as he's going through the account. John spends most of his gospel on the last few days of Jesus' life, and he gives us greater, greater detail in what had happened that night. And we pick up in chapter 18 of John's account of it. Verse 4, watch this. Now Jesus, Jesus therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward as they came, approached, and he said to them, Whom are you seeking? And they answered, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said, I am. Now, if you got your Bible and it's italicized he, that it, because it's italicized, what they're telling you, what the writers are telling you is that in the original language, the he is not there. They added it for, to help you understand the sentence. What Jesus is declaring is they said, you were looking for Jesus was now this, and Jesus says, I am. And notice what happens as he says, I am. And Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with him. And when he said to them, I am, they drew back and they fell to the ground. And he asked them again, who are you seeking? <laughs> and now they're on the ground now. <laughs> and they said, Jesus of Nazareth? <laughs> and Jesus said, I told you that I am. Therefore, if you seek me, let these skies go their way, that the same may be fulfilled which he spoke of those whom you gave me, I have lost none. Now, guys, I understand the significance of what Jesus has just done to this crowd of Pharisees, scribes, and Roman soldiers. Jesus declared that he is the I am. The, the word I am. If you're familiar with the Old Testament, it's the name that God gave himself to Moses. You see, Moses was about to go into Egypt and tell the children of Israel that they were going to be freed from their bondage and slavery. And Moses, before he's going in, he says, God, who do I tell him sent me? You're the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but how do, how do I tell him, you know, your name? And God says to them in Exodus chapter 3, there in verse 14, God said to Moses, I am who I am. Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent you. You see, Jesus in declaring himself I am is declaring himself to be God. The very statement I am would declare that he is self-sufficient. It declares that he is self-existent. And his existence wasn't contingent upon anyone else. He's the I am. That word literally means to be. That's the verb that's used for the name of God, to be. You see, if a hundred years ago I were to try to describe myself, I would be the I will. A <laughs> hundred years from now, I was the I was. But God's able to say, I am the I am. 
I, I, I'm the one that's self-existence. That, that there's no beginning. There's no end. I am. And he is everything. The creator, the sustainer, the king, the judge. He is. And as Jesus says, I am, guys, all of the 600 plus religious leaders fall to the ground just at the power of his name. If that didn't get their attention, I, I, don't, I don't know what does. Just as he speaks the word, they bow, fall. Because the I am has just spoken. Now, throughout the Gospel of John, Jesus made I am statements over and over. He declared to be the I am. And they considered it blasphemy for someone to call themselves the I am because you're calling yourself God. And we'll see that as, as, as we continue with the passage. Now, I, I, I want you to take note, guys. Over and over, Jesus would say, I am, and he would say that when it came to um, different aspects of who he was. He says, I am the bread of life. I'm, I'm, the, I'm the one who sustains life. He would say, I am the light of the world. He, he's, 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 he's what illuminates. He would declare himself to be the door for the sheep. I am the door for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life, he would declare. He would say, I am the way the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father except through me. That I am. He would use it in, in, in one more time in John chapter 15 where he says, I am the vine and you are the branches. And every branch that that that's, abides in me is going to produce fruit. But every branch that's not abiding in me will shrivel up. He is the branch. He's the vine, and we, we being the branches. He, he is. He, he's the I am. And what's, what's amazing is as Jesus declares that to them, they fall back. They, you know, obviously get back up, dusting off their armor, and they ask again, you know, Jesus asks again, hey, who are you guys looking for? And they said, um, Jesus of Nazareth, and he says, I am, he said, let, my, let the guys go, because scripture's got to be fulfilled. You know, these, you can't touch none of these guys but I'll go with you. And he goes peacefully. Now, again, Mark gives us the, 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 the shorthand version. John, again, tells us, and, and, and I like how Mark goes, you know, one of the apostles pulled out a sword and cut off the ear of one of the guys. John didn't do that. John said, Simon Peter pulled the sword out. He ratted on him. Matthew, Mark, and Luke never mention who did it. They just say, hey, wait, some one of the guys, you know, they're, John and Peter had some kind of competition going on. They, these guys had some kind of like, they were jockeying. Because, because when, <laughs> when, when they're running to the tomb, John's account of it is that Peter was ahead of me and then I ran past him. And I beat him. He wanted everyone to know that he was faster than Peter. <laughs> so there was this, there was, and, and he was like, you know what, Peter pulled out the sword. Man, can you believe that, Peter? He cut off the ear of Melchus, the high priest's servant. And Jesus says, put your sheath back in. Put your, your sword back in your sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? That, that, that's how John would account it. Matthew gives us even greater insight in this particular passage. Matthew tells us 
that when Jesus told Peter, Peter, put your sword away. And now, you know, think about the, the, what a scene that would have been. There's, there's 600 soldiers armed. There's 11 apostles. Now, you've got to give Peter some credit. You got 600 soldiers there, and he pulls out this, and it just <sighs> took the cut. And I, I don't know, you know, Melchus kind of saw the sword coming, go sideways, and whew, lops an ear. And Jesus says, put, put, your, put your sword away. Looks in the dust, you know, they're there in the Mount of Olives. I imagine it would have been just, just dirt, and, you know, picks up his ear, licks it off, and puts it back on. But then Jesus says some words, and, and, and Matthew's account of it, Matthew chapter 26, and I, I, think, I think there's some, there's some just heavy implications on, on this passage in, in Matthew's account of it. Watch what Jesus said. Put your sword in his place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot pray to my father and he will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? How then could the scripture be fulfilled that it must happen thus? Now, a detachment was 600 soldiers. A legion was 10 detachments or six thousand soldiers and Jesus says to Peter Peter do you think that I couldn't at this very moment call down 12 legions 72,000 angels and not have to go through what I'm about to go through do you do you think that that somehow this is a physical battle when in reality, it's a spiritual battle. And that I have the access right now to all of the angels of heaven that can come down and swoop down and wipe out every one of these enemies of mine. Guys, here's what I think you and I need to take note of is that Jesus was very capable of taking care of himself right here. He could have easily got out of that. One angel, in, in, in the Old Testament, the book of Kings, one angel killed 185,000 Assyrians. Do you think 600 Romans were really a problem? <laughs> one angel was able to wipe out 185,000 Assyrians? You, you, do you think that, that Jesus is going, oh, no, that, that's not the problem here. What Jesus is wanting you and I to understand is that this wasn't a physical battle. Peter's got his sword out thinking it's a physical battle. And what Jesus is saying, look, this is a spiritual battle. We're told in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 through 5, it says this, for we don't war against flesh and blood. No, that's, that's Ephesians 6, I'm sorry. He says in, in 1 2 Corinthians 10 that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty in God for pulling down strongholds and arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And, and what, what, what he's saying is, is, is look, we, we can't win a, a, a spiritual battle on a physical level. Your sword can't deliver you. Your AR can't deliver you. None of your weaponry of, of, of hum, human means can ever win this battle. This is a spiritual battle. And Jesus is declaring, I'm going to the cross, not because I, I, I'm trapped or because I'm arrested. I'm going to the cross because I love you. I'm going to the cross because I'm, I'm going to pay the price for sin for all of humanity. And it's the cup that the Father's placed upon me. And he's, and he's saying, look, should I not drink the cup that the Father's given me? I can call down angels right now. And they can come and wipe all these guys out. And it could be another great Bible story. <laughs> but that's not the plan. I'm going to drink the cup. And so it, it's, it's interesting that 
Jesus at this point goes with the soldiers. All of his disciples flee. And how they did this, Jesus is going to take note of. Because even though they're, they're, they're fulfilling prophecy, even though it's according to the scripture, they would be held accountable for what they've done. Take note of this. Jesus calls them out right here. Jesus answered and said to them, have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to take me? I was daily with you in the temple teaching. You did not seize me, but the scripture must be fulfilled. And they all forsook him and he fled. Now, now notice what Jesus says to these religious leaders. I think it's very specific to the religious leaders that he's addressing here. I, I was there in your temple. I was teaching every day. You saw the miracles that were transpiring while I was in your temple. And you didn't even attempt to, 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 to seize me when, when I was right there in front of you. And then you come and do it under the cover of night. You come and do it in some illegal fashion in order to, you know, take me away. And, th man, this struck me when I was, when I was reading that. Man, you, you guys, truth has to be hidden in order for evil to prevail. Are we not watching that in our culture right now? They're counseling anyone that's going to speak truth right now. They want to cover truth because if truth is, is declared, that then, then truth wins. And so those that are doing evil are trying to, to cover truth. So they just, they'll just silence any voice that doesn't go along with the narrative. They'll silence any voice that, that's going to say what they don't want you to, to be said because they know that if truth is unleashed, then truth will prevail. And so they come to Jesus by night. I was reading one of the commentators, I think it was uh, Kent Hughes on this passage. He says, though the assembly had all the trappings of illegal proceedings, it was not legal. According to its own rules, it was not to make final judgments at night, nor was it to do so outside of its sacred chambers in the temple, nor was a capital offense to be determined during Passover to name just a few illeg illegalities. You see, all these things they were doing was against the law. It was all against the rule of law for the temple, for the religious leaders. They, 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 they were not to judge or make a final judgment at night at any time. It was to be done during the day. So it wasn't done something underhanded. That was, that was the law, the rule of law. It was not to be done outside of the temple courts. This was a religious hearing. It was to be done at the temple. They're doing it at the house of Caiaphas. And then they were doing it on the Passover feast, which have also been no capital punishments could be handed down during the Passover, and they were doing that. They didn't care about the rule of law. And that's how they came after Jesus. And it's how evil always operates. It never operates in, in the light. Evil doesn't operate under the rule of law. It always does something underhanded and under, uh, un, you know, stealth so that no one else can see, and that's exactly what they're doing here. Don't forget who is behind all of this, Judas. We're told that Judas was filled by Satan, that Satan literally came and dwelt inside of Jesus as he left the room at the Last Supper. This, this is Satan's MO. This is how Satan operates. He's a liar, he's a cheat, he's a thief, he's a robber. 
But what he does is he turns around and accuses everyone else of what he himself was doing. That, 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 that's that's the, 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 the paradigm here. You know, you, you just, you, whenever evil tries to explain itself, it always projects upon those that he's accusing of doing the very same thing that he's doing. That's Satan's role. Now, verse 51, we, we have an interesting like, little insert here. And you, you read this, and, and I can't tell you how many people the last week going, what is that all about? Well, check, watch what it says. Now, a certain young man followed him, having a linen cloth thrown around his naked body. And the young man laid hold of him. Now, the young men, there was other young men were, were there at, at, the, at the, the seizure of Jesus. The young men laid hold of him, and he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked. And you're going, why is that there? Right? I mean, who's bragging about being a streaker, really? And just, because he's, so, so, so most scholars, agree that, that this would have been Mark. He would have been a young boy at the time of this event. They believe, many believe that, that it would have been the upper room would have been Mark's parents who owned the upper room, at least his mom, who was a godly woman, we know for sure, and that they had allowed Jesus to use the room. And Mark, being kind of there in the house, kind of followed the disciples, kind of was outside the garden as a young boy, 12, 13 years old, watching all of this. And he says, all I had was a linen cloth on. I was there watching all of this go down. And they seized Jesus and they tried to grab me, but I slipped out of my, you know, my cloth and I didn't have nothing on under. And I went running home, but I was there. Right? <laughs> and it's just his, his way of saying, hey, I, 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 I saw these things happen. That would have been, you know, remember, Peter's the one who's giving Mark this account. Mark's writing down Peter's account. That, that's what the gospel of Mark is. But Mark, for once in this whole story, he's able to say, I saw it. <laughs> I, 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 was, I was an eyewitness. I was streaking that night. Just so you guys know. <laughs> Just, I, I don't know why he wanted us to know that, but he did. Verse 53. And they led Jesus away to the high priest. And with him were assembled all of the chief priests and the elders and the scribes. This would have been the Sanhedrin. This would have been all of the upper ranking uh, spiritual leaders in Jerusalem. Remember, it's Passover. All of them would have been there and it would have been a night of, of you know, just great festivities. And so they all gather together. They have Jesus now arrested. They are going to pull them into Caiaphas's house. It's, it's, it, when we, when, if you get to go with, to Israel with us, one of the stops we'll make is Caiaphas's house. And they literally know the, not only the area, but they believe they know the place that Jesus would have been held. There's a little room that's kind of a prison there at Caiaphas's house. And, and, and you, you know, you're just... Um, able to kind of really kind of wrap your mind around how all of this went down. Now, Caiaphas was the high priest in Israel. But he was the high priest that was appointed by the Roman government. Annas was the high priest that was recognized by the, relig by, by the people of Jerusalem. He had been removed from the position and his son-in-law would have taken the position, Caiaphas. And so they're gonna first take him to Caiaphas' house, then they're gonna take him to Annas. And so th there's this, this whole, uh, um, almost, to the point where there was, there was really two high priests at the time, one that was appointed and one who was acknowledged. So 
wizard going through the story, you'll, you'll, you'll kind of see that there, there's two different people mentioned. Now, verse 54, Peter followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he sat with the servants and he warmed himself at the fire. The chief priests and all the council sought testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. For many bore witness against him, but their testimony did not agree. And some rose up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I'll destroy this temple made with hands, and within three days I will build another made without hands. But not even then did their testimony agree. Now, they're now trying to make accusations against Jesus. And really, they're throwing mud at the wall and trying to see what sticks. They're just, you know, making up accusations against him. And so they're, they're doing so, but in this court setting, you know, they're going, okay, so when did this happen? And they were contradicting each other in their, in their statements. And so they really had nothing that's sticking. One of the, or two of them, because you had to have at least two witnesses, two of them says, look, we heard him say something that, that you know, maybe this will stick. <laughs> we heard him say that he was going to destroy this temple and in three days he was going to raise it up. Now, Jesus did say that. But he wasn't talking about the temple. He was talking about his body. That his body would be destroyed. And in three days, it would be resurrected. Now, it, it, isn't that ironic that that was the accusation that they bring against him and it's going to be the very thing that it just within the next hours was going to actually transpire is his body's destroyed and then three days later, he's going to rise from the grave. And so they're bringing these accusations, but even then, they couldn't really agree. Their, their testimony didn't line up. And now the chief priest is, is a little bit upset. He's going to ask Jesus, look, look at verse 60. The high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, saying, do you answer nothing? Was it, what is it that these men testify against you? You see, Jesus hadn't yet spoke. All of these accusations, and Jesus hasn't even opened his mouth. That in itself was a, was a fulfillment of scripture. That he's not, he's not trying to defend himself. He's, he's not trying to say, oh, you guys are liars, or you, you know, you, you guys are trying to trap me. Jesus said nothing. And in the book of Isaiah chapter 53, in the seventh verse, this is how it reads. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before the shears and silent. So he opened not his mouth. The very trial that Jesus is enduring was prophesied. And he doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't try to give a defense. He doesn't try, try to undermine the, the, the accusations that were brought against him. Just like the scriptures foretold. But the chief priest is going to ask him a very important question. And it's one that Jesus com is compelled to answer. Notice verse 61. And he kept silent and answered nothing. Again, the high priest asked him, saying to him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? Now, he just came straight out. He says, okay, I I'm, I'm going to ask you a question that... If you are, you're going you're gonna to be compelled to answer. Are you the Messiah? That's what he's asking. Are you the Christ? That, that word Christ means anointed. And it means the one, that, that reference is the one that was promised to come and deliver the nation of Israel, the Messiah, the anointed one. 
And he just said, are you the Christ? Are you the son of the blessed? Now the Jews wouldn't say the name of God. It was too holy. And so they replaced the name of God by calling God the blessed rather than calling God the I am. The coming one, the becoming one. And then Jesus says it again. Notice what Jesus said. I am. If anyone tries to tell you Jesus never claimed to be God, they're lying to you. Jesus declared, used the name of God when he was asked the question, are you the Messiah? And he says, I am. I'm the becoming one. I'm the self-existing one. And in case you think, no, he's just saying I am, you know, what you said I am, notice what he says immediately after. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. You can't mistake it. He just referenced three Old Testament prophecies concerning the Messiah. And every, every, every one of them Pharisees and scribes would have known that Jesus was making that claim. Matter of fact, he's going to tear his robe and say, blasphemy. You're calling yourself God. That, that, that's, that's what their response to this is. Now, Jesus fulfilled three of those prophecies. One of them was, was found in Isaiah 52, 8. And I'm just going to read it to you. He's saying, what he's saying in that prophecy is that the leaders of Israel would see the Messiah when he comes. And, and here he is standing right in front of them, the, the Son of Man right there. It says, when the Lord returns to Zion, they will see it with their own eyes. That's Isaiah 52, 8. And they, they were witnessing the Messiah right in their midst. There was another passage in Psalm 110, the first verse. It says, the Lord says to the Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool for your feet. And Jesus, in that prophecy, said, you're going to see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power. Fulfillment of prophecy, two of them. But there was one more that would have been very hard to miss, the prophecy of Daniel chapter 7. And it's there I'm going to ask you to turn for a moment, Daniel chapter 7. Daniel's prophecy, Belshazzar had a dream. And Belshazzar was the king of Babylon. The Babylonian empire had, had been the world power of the day. And he was able to see into the future of what was going to happen. But Daniel was, was there. He, he saw the whole dream, but he didn't know what it meant. And he, Daniel, the prophet, is there to interpret the dream for him. And as Daniel's interpreting the dream of, of everything that had taken place, he tells them that, you know, you're the great superpower, but there's going to become another one. The Medo-Persian Empire is going to overthrow you guys. And that's exactly what happened in history. The Medo-Persian Empire overthrew the Babylonian Empire. The Grecian Empire overthrew the Medo-Persian Empire, just like this dream unfolded. And then the Roman Empire would come into power. And the superpowers that came to be were all identified up until the day of Jesus. And the Romans were in power. 
And then he's told of a fifth kingdom, and it's what is called the renewed Roman Empire, which would be the last world power to exist. And he explains all of this in this dream, and Daniel interprets it for him. But at the end of the dream, he tells them of a, another power that would come in verse 13 of Daniel chapter 7. And, and we're, we're going to read the two verses together. And I was watching in the night vision. And behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom. And all peoples and nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall never pass away. His kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. You see, Jesus said, you're going to see coming in the clouds, the Son of Man. And every one of them would have thought of this passage, the Son of Man coming in the clouds. And Jesus is declaring himself to be who Daniel was referencing. The Messiah that has a kingdom that never ends. A dominion that's everlasting. All the other kingdoms come and go. Babylonians come and go. The Medo Persians come and go. The Greeks, Alexander the Great, come and gone. The Roman Empire, no longer. But this kingdom. An everlasting kingdom. Forever and ever. Dominion and rule forever. And the Pharisees and the scribes understand that Jesus is calling himself God. I am. The son of God that's coming in the clouds. That's me. You ask me if I'm the Messiah. I, I, let, 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 let me tell you, I'm the one that Daniel was talking about. I'm the one that the psalmist was talking about. I, I'm, I'm the one that Isaiah was referencing. I am. And my kingdom will have no end. And you will see me in the clouds. The high priest rips his clothes. He says, we have no further need to, to have any more witnesses. You've heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And they condemned him to be deserving of death. That was what sealed it. They didn't have any accusations that stuck, but because he claimed to be the Messiah, that's why we're going to kill him. That, that's, that's what they had concluded. And at that very moment, they began to spit on him. They, they, put, they would put a blindfold on him and it says that they would begin to beat him. Blows. Now it's one thing to take a punch and you see which way the punch is coming because then you can kind of go with it. <laughs> but to be blindfolded and to take a punch. You have, you, you have no ability to react in any way, and it's just the severity of that blow is much greater. And they use that to mock him. They would say, prophesy. If you're the Messiah, then tell us who hit you. 
If, if you're God, why, why don't you just declare to us, you know, which one of us punched you? Tell us our name, you know, the, the ones that are doing it. And they just began to humiliate Jesus. And in doing so, they were actually fulfilling prophecy. In Isaiah chapter 50, verse 6, I gave my back to those who struck me, my cheeks to those who plucked out the beard, and I did not hide my face from shame and spitting. And that's what they were doing. They were spitting in his face. That's probably one of the most humiliating things you can do to a person. Just spit on their face. We were in Israel one time. We were kind of walking down the street and two cars, they didn't hit, but they nearly collided and brakes, you heard the brakes, everyone's watching. They jump out of the car and I just heard, you know, in Hebrew, just going at each other. And I, I, he didn't just do that. And the other guy, and I'm, I'm just like, this is weird. I never see, I mean, you know, and they just back and forth. Someone spits in your face, that is like, like I'd rather punch me <laughs> before you spit in my face. But that's exactly what they did to Jesus. And he took it. The 12 legion of angels were still waiting. I, I, I bet they were just going, oh Lord, let us out of him, let us out of him. they withheld. Jesus never asked for them. And he didn't because he was going to drink the cup that was provided him. And he did it because he loves you. He did it because he wanted to rescue you. He's provided everything necessary for you and I to be washed from our sin. He took our shame. He took our beating. He took our death. And he paid it in full for you and for me. That's how much he loves you. And he's given you the opportunity. You, 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 can, you can join in the choir and spit in his face too. You can reject the love that he's declared to you. You can just say, you know what, I, I, I don't want nothing that Jesus, you know, I, I don't need him. I don't, and you, you can do the very same thing that these guys were doing. Or you can bow your knee and say, God, I didn't deserve it. I didn't do anything to earn it, but you did it for me. And the only response that I can have is to surrender my life to you because that's why he did it, because he wants you. He wants your heart. He wants your, your devotion. He wants your attention. He, he loves you. And he purchased you with his own blood. See, Judas was, was an interesting character because Judas, right there in the middle of, for three years with Jesus, and he hardened his heart. Betrayed Jesus. 
We're going to see Peter. Next week, we're, we're just going to, we're going to look at, at Peter's opportunity because yeah, Peter's an interesting study. Because you watch Peter, this guy who was like, Lord, I'll never forsake you. I'll never leave you. I'll, you know, I'll die with you. And he blows it in the garden with the ear incident. Then he starts to follow Jesus, but he's following him afar off. And I, I think Peter was like, you know what, Lord, I'll never leave you. I, you know, I might have blown it in the garden, but you know what, I'm, I'm still going to be here. But he's now at a distance. And then from that distance, you're going to find that Peter was there sitting with the enemies of God. And then he's going to be warming himself at the fire with those who rejected God too. Got comfortable. And I think there's, 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 a, there's a lesson there for us. We'll, we'll, we'll look at that next week. But it's incredible because Jesus now is going to be taken before Pontius Pilate and, and he's going to be condemned to death. It, it, guys, I, I, I've been 30 years teaching the scriptures. We're leading right up to Resurrection Sunday. We're going to finish Mark, I think, on Easter morning. Never happened before. I'm, I'm like, this is pretty cool. We're just, we're looking at the life of Jesus right up to the last minute. We started Mark you know, a year ago, and here we find ourselves right on this particular passage, right at this particular time. I'm like, man, that's pretty cool, Lord. I, I, I couldn't have planned it. I'm not that smart. <laughs> I just don't have <laughs> Just, but here we are, looking at the life of Jesus to the last hour. And it, it's, it's pretty cool to, to see and then you realize that, you know what, he did all of this. He did all of this to rescue you and I. And if you need to be rescued this morning, you need a savior, you need to ask Christ to come into your heart. Man, we want to give you that opportunity this morning before we close our time together. Jesus would, would say, if, if you want to follow me, you want to be a disciple of mine, pick up your cross and follow me. There was always a, 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 an action that had to take place. You, you would have to make a decision if you want to be a follower of his. And I want to give you an opportunity this morning if you want to be a follower of his. Maybe you've never asked Christ to come into your life, asked him to forgive you for your sins. Uh, we're, we're going we're gonna to take a couple moments now and we're, we're going we're gonna to worship and the team's going to come up right now. And if God is speaking to your heart and you realize, you know what, Jesus did all that for me and I, I don't want to walk away from that great price that he paid. I want, I, want to, I want to receive the forgiveness that he accomplished. I, I want to ask the team, we're going, to, we're going to sing a quick chorus. If God is speaking to your heart, you're ready to surrender your life to Christ and become a follower of his. I'm going to ask you to stand up and come right here in front of this platform and I want to pray with you. A decision. A decision to follow Jesus is what I'm asking. And if you're ready to do that, man, as we sing this, war, this song, as we worship, I'm going to ask you to stand up and come. Now, after we're done here, I've asked that pastors, the elders, they're going to be up here. If you need prayer for anything else, they're, they're going to be up here available for, for prayer. So that we'll, we'll have an opportunity for prayer for, for those that need prayer. But if you're here and you say, you know what, I, I need to get right with God. I need to ask him to be my Lord and forgive me my sins. I don't want to repent this morning. I'm going to ask you to take that step of faith. I'm going to ask you to stand up and come right here in front of this platform. I want to pray with you. And let's, let's worship the Lord. Father, we ask that you, God, would just, Lord, quiet our hearts. That right now, God, if, if you, by your spirit, are, are drawing us to that place of repentance and that place where we surrender. God, I pray right now, God, your spirit would move here in our midst. And that, God, you would give us that, that desire to do so, Lord, to yield our lives to you. In Jesus' name. As we sing, as we worship, if you're in the foyer, those doors are open. Man, come on in. If you're here, man, right here in front of this platform. I give you that opportunity right now to make a choice, to make a decision, to be a follower of the King this worship. And 
This is my desire to honor you, Lord, with all my heart, I worship you. Just as we continue to worship, and maybe you're here, man, and you're, you're battling with it. Your heart may be pounding out of your chest. That's the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit's trying to draw you. You see, God's a gentleman. He'll, he'll never force you. He'll, he'll never put you in an arm bar or headlock and make you tap out. He'll never do it. He gives you the choice. The choice to to surrender your will and and your life and say, God, I I, I want now to be a follower of yours. And maybe you're still there. Maybe you're you're, you're here with your friends and you're worried, what what are they going to think? Or, well, if they go, I'll go. Or maybe it's your husband, your wife. You know, if they'll do it, I'll do it. It's not between you and them. It's between you and God. That's what matters. And so if you're still sitting, I, I believe there's some of you this morning and you know who you are and God's, God's knocking on your heart right now. I encourage you, man, don't wait. Don't put it off. If he's knocking on your heart, that, that, that's the, an amazing thing that, that God's drawn you. The danger is you ignore it and you ignore it and you ignore it. And what happens is your heart becomes harder and harder and harder every time you hear God's voice and you reject His offer of forgiveness, your heart gets harder. So if you're just sitting in that seat and you're thinking, well, maybe next time, maybe next week, maybe next month, maybe next year, you're you're just just setting yourself up for a harder and harder and harder choice. So if you're here, man, God's speaking, man, we're going to sing that one more chorus, just one real time, really quick. And if that's you, man, just, just quickly. Quickly, come on up, man. I want to pray for you as we go. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. And I live for you alone. Every breath that I take, every moment I'm awake. Lord, have your way in me. Yes, Lord, I give you my heart, give you my soul. And I live for you alone. Every breath that I take, every moment I'm away. Lord, have your way in me. Come and have your way in me. Jesus, have your way in me. Amen. Amen. Come. Anybody else, come, man. We'll wait for you. the absolute most important decision.
most important decision of your whole life is this decision. It's the only one that's going to matter for eternity. And if there's anybody else, man, we'll wait for you. It's that important. God's speaking to you just like these, man. So cool. It's awesome. We're excited for you guys. The Bible says this. That when one sinner repents, the angels in heaven rejoice. They're partying up there right now. They're partying. And you're taking that first step, that step where, man, you're inviting God's spirit to come and dwell inside of you. And it's like a newborn baby. You're just like this little infant, and, and you now your soul needs to be fed and nurtured so you grow to maturity. That, that's, that's, that's our desire for you, is that you become strong in your faith. We're going to pray, and this prayer, your prayer, from your heart to God, I'm going to ask you to say it out loud to him. The Bible says it like this, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's what the Bible tells us. And so we're going to do what it declares. So we're going to do what it says. And we're going to, with our mouth and from our heart, we're going to say these words, just pray together. Repeat these words to God. Dear God, I confess to you, I'm a sinner. And I thank you for sending Jesus. That he died for me. That he rose from the grave that he defeated death. God, may your spirit live inside of me. Fill me right now, Lord. Guide and direct my life. I surrender it to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you guys.